So let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Marissa Gadiali. I'm the Chief of Addiction Medicine at Kaiser San Francisco. Um, I am a graduate of this program when they did addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry. I'm thrilled to be faculty here. Um, and this is part of our Addiction Psychiatry Fellows Boot Camp, and I think then we have a lot of folks who want to be part of it. Um, and we have a whole 50 minutes to talk about two topics. Honestly, each one of these topics could take a really long time, so we're doing the condensed version, and I really, I think of it as like the basics. So um, that's what we're really going to focus on. I do like to ask some questions out to the crowd just to see that everybody's awake. Um, so, um, our first stop is going to be alcohol withdrawal. Our second stop will be opiate withdrawal. We'll try and spend about half and half time on each. And if we whiz through some things somewhat quickly, then we'll have some time for questions. Cool? Okay. Okay, so alcohol is by far one of the, one of the single biggest reason why people come into addiction treatment. Um, and as many times as we see all the other opiate epidemic and it's like coming for you. Let me tell you, alcohol still is a very serious issue um, and it causes a lot of morbidity and mortality out there in our country and in the world. Um, and certainly we have wine country in our backyard. So just keep that in mind that like, you know, it's the Bay Area. Um, a lot of times people don't see their alcohol use because it's like, you know, it's dressed up in Napa Valley. But let me tell you, there's a lot, like you really have to think about quantities. Remember, that's going to be a, one of the big things that we're going to hit home is, is that don't think about how fancy the bottle is. Think about quantities of alcohol. Okay. I hope my slides advance. Okay. Um, just some quick statistics. These, I feel like these kinds of things change, but I feel like these, these are the things that I tend to think about the most, is that realize that most Americans do drink, okay? If you look at how many people have had at least one drink in their lifetime, it's like 85%. So this is just people who regularly drink, who say that they drank in the last month. You get about two thirds of the US population. Um, a much smaller percentage will actually meet criteria, and this is an oldish statistic for abuse or dependence, um, or just a higher severity use disorder. Okay, but a lot more people will fall under the, um, the quantities issue around risky drinking, at risk drinking. So they will have consequences to their health before they end up actually showing all these behavioral use disorder criteria. Okay, realize that when people actually make it into your primary care setting or they come into the hospital, there is a higher chance that they actually have um, a problem with their um, with uh, with alcohol and through the emergency room um, we're getting into about a quarter of people who come in through the emergency department by ambulance they have issues with um, alcohol okay so what are what are the guidelines okay um, so men are allowed a greater drink tolerance than women and then I'm going to ask you why um, for men, it is no more than two a day, which is sort of on average at 14 a week, no more than five in one setting. And um, for women, no more than one a day, seven per week, or four in one setting. Okay. Question number one. Why is there a difference between men and women? Yes. Um, the lower body fat relative to females. Yes. And why does that make a difference? Um, I know it's something about something that yeah sometimes I just think of it as like you know um, water to fat ratio and alcohol dissolves in water and the more water you have the less of an alcohol concentration you get and that your brain sees in terms of concentration so the higher fat ratio you have then the less body water you have and so you see a proportionally higher um, concentration fantastic thanks um, so what is a standard drink? Okay, this is, these are all part of like classic alcohol. Realize that countries define this differently. Um, for example, um, does anybody know, okay, wait, first question. How many grams of alcohol is in a standard drink? I can give you some options. 25 grams of alcohol, 
20 grams, 8 grams, 12 grams. No, 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 no takers. But, but, yes, Dr. Renus. So um, 12 grams. Now, sometimes I've also seen about like 14 grams. I was also reading that um, in Japan, they benchmark it to 18 grams, and in the UK, it's eight grams. So people define it differently. You know, if you look at standard drinking charts in the UK, it'll say something like, it'll, it'll talk about things in pints. Um, but in the US, we use ounces. And so a can of beer is 12 ounces. Um, that's not fortified, that's like a regular can of beer, and that's benchmarked to about 12 grams of alcohol. Okay, next question. How many glasses of wine are in a bottle? Five. Five. Six. Five. Fabulous. Okay. Sometimes people think four, because, you know, that's really how much, like, you know, it takes to share one. But just realize those are a little bigger than what people have been talking about, um, and they pour heavy in wine country. Okay, so just remember, five ounces, five drinks are in those things. Um, okay, so back to our... One question, uh, what are the difference between alcohol metabolism between men and women? Um, women have total, lower total body water. Um, alcohol dehydrogenase, um, there might be less of it in women, so less of alcohol gets metabolized, more goes into your bloodstream and your system, and so higher concentrations are seen to the brain, and there may be um, hormonal differences. And then there are age differences, okay? So this might make sense, right? Where do we see the highest amount of binge, heavy alcohol use in current use? When you can, if you guys can see this, what age do we see that all at? <laughs> college age, right? We, we know college age drinking. How old do you have to be to rent a car before they um, you make they make you have like you can you can rent a car all on your own no co-signers no nothing 25 25 right so the insurance companies kind of know this they know they know when you're at highest risk for risky behavior um, heavy alcohol use binge drinking we understand about college drinking um, so that's kind of the age how long does it take for your um, frontal lobe to myelinate Yes, exactly. And where, how does it myelinate? Front to back or back to front? Back to front, right? So you are very coordinated in the beginning of your life, but then you don't have a lot of executive function, and so that's why you do a lot of risky activities, um, but you're really coordinated at it. That's why we have all those amazing snowboarders when they're like quite young, because they'll take lots of risks and they don't really think about the broken bone, but then you get into it when you're older and all you can think about are broken bones, like me. <laughs> okay, so um, how are different ways that you can figure out if somebody is using alcohol and you need to make an intervention? So um, what are some ways that you can figure out if your patient in front of you is using alcohol at a risky level? Ask them. Ask them. That's a fabulous question, uh, answer. Okay, and, and are there any structured ways that we could ask them? Nick, what kind of questions would you are you drinking a lot? Are there is there some kind of questionnaire that we might use? There are more than five in a setting for men or four in a setting for women. Okay, so like just a straight flat question. Is there like a tool that you would ever use? Yeah, like an audit C, for example. Fabulous. What is an audit C? So it's basically most of the DSM criteria minus one. Okay, or that's like a like a, I thought like an audit C. Sometimes sometimes my memory fails me. That was like the three best questions, and then the full audit is like the eight. And like that, that makes absolute sense. But there's like, and you know, the audit goes through, you can find it all online, A-U-D-I-T. Um, it will go through quantities and some consequences of alcohol, and then it puts you on kind of a spectrum. It's actually very good at diagnosing, um, well, helping to screen for alcohol problems, and then you go through the process of diagnosing someone. Now, there are some other ways that you can also die, like at least help to figure out whether or not alcohol is creating a problem in someone's body. And so I like to put out medical things like the AST, which is an inflammatory marker from your liver, okay? It can rise quite acutely um, when you have alcoholic hepatitis. 
Uh, the problem, and sometimes like you know you can you can sort of see like a high AST to ALT ratio, um, which helps you to kind of understand that this might be an alcoholic hepatitis. Sometimes that helps you to like even start a conversation with a patient. You know, the amount of alcohol that you're drinking is too much for your body. Actually, your liver is showing signs of inflammation. Um, the thing about AST to ALT ratio is, is that it's not, although it is sensitive when you see it, it's not very, um, you don't see it all the time, okay? So it doesn't, it, when it happens, it can be pretty good for showing you alcoholic hepatitis, but you know, you're not gonna be able to diagnose like alcohol use disorder on the basis of it. The other thing that I do like to look at is MCV. Certainly when I do consults in the hospital, I always take a look at these things so that I can always talk to patients about, you know, it looks like your body and your bone marrow are seeing a lot of stress from your alcohol use. And do you expect MCV to be high or low? And what is it? Higher. It's higher? Yeah. Okay, and what is MCV? Mm, uh, mean corpuscular value, the erythrocyte. It's about the size, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. A, it's the size of your red blood vessel, and it gets a little large. Um, there are some, it, some of the factors are around the fact that alcohol kind of poisons your bone marrow a little bit, and then it creates abnormal looking um, erythrocytes, and then you can see that. So I know, like, somebody's, somebody's having a lot of stress in their bone marrow from alcohol use when they have a high MCV. Okay. I put this picture up. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a couple of years ago. I found myself in um, Pompeii. And I was just, like walking around like some of those ancient sites and stuff like that. And there's this there's this town called Herculaneum, which was like, you know, when Mount Vesuvius blew, then it got buried and they excavated it. And, you know, they have this alley where, you know, it's like the old town. This is like AD, what was it? It was like 80 AD. That's when all this happened. And they have this area where they where it's clearly a shop and it's selling you alcohol. Okay, so I just mean to say that alcohol use is very old. It's been around for a long time. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the neurophysiology of alcohol. Now, and this is important because you'll remember back to what Dr. Baki was talking about, where he was talking about the different ways that we can intervene on alcohol use disorder, and some of the ways that um, the mechanism of action for alcohol then become important because of what it does, and then that's what gives us some indications for what medication interventions could be useful. So one thing that alcohol does is that it potentiates um, GABA at the GABA alpha receptor, and that if you chronically use alcohol, of course, it will decrease the amount of receptors out there. Okay. The other thing that it does um, is that it inhibits glutamate at the NMDA receptor. Chronic alcohol increases the number of NMDA receptors, right, because if you antagonize the NMDA receptor, then it will eventually, you'll create more receptors because they're waiting for a little bit of neurotransmitter out there, okay? So they're all waiting there to then create a little bit of problems when you stop putting alcohol on them, okay? So now we look at the alcohol withdrawal syndrome, okay? Again, very old. Um, Hippocrates, very wise man. If a man was in the prime of his life, and from drinking, he has trembling hands. It may be well to announce beforehand either delirium or convulsions. So they very much understood at that time that you know if you're a heavy drinker and then you stop drinking and you have trembling hands, you might have a seizure. Okay, so this is a little graphic around it, just to show you that in the beginning, you you know you're not drinking alcohol and your GABA and your glutamate are in homeostasis. You occasionally use alcohol, and you increase the amount of GABA and alcohol, and the, the seesaw turns to one side, and the glutamate, it really hasn't activated very much, okay? So um, you haven't really blocked it down enough, and so for the most part, you get like the nice sedating effects of alcohol in addition to like, you know, the disinhibiting effects, which is, you know, is a social lubricant, and it's, you know, why people drink. And then over time, as you're a chronic user, you have blocked a lot of those glutamate receptors, you increase the amount there, and you're sort of, as long as you're drinking, then you're not going to have exactly a problem. And then when you stop drinking, which is then what we think of as alcohol withdrawal, you have kind of a surge of the 
excitatory neurotransmitter, or the glutamate, and you don't have the GABA being activated. So that's why we have a hyperadrenergic, hyperexcitatory state. Are you guys with me? You're with me? Good, good, good. I know, the neurobiology, we have to kind of like get through it a little bit to then kind of discuss the medications, which are really important. Um, certainly, um, the fellows that I have that are gonna be seeing consults in the hospital, we have to really kind of be able to explain this to others. Those of you who are, who are gonna like take care of hospitalized patients will definitely see alcohol withdrawal, and I'd like for you to just have a little bit of a languaging around it. So this is the alcohol withdrawal time course. Um, when we talk about like, just, you know, alcohol withdrawal comes in, you know, many sizes. I like to think of it as small, medium, and large. And, um, you know, a lot of people will go through minor symptoms, okay? But they won't have many medical issues. The minor symptoms don't always need to be medicated either. Um, and those include things like anxiety, insomnia, headache. Um, and then we'll talk about alcoholic hallucinosis. And then if you get into more severe range of alcohol, then you can get into withdrawal seizures. Um, those can happen anywhere in the first, you know, 48 to 96 hours after stopping alcohol. And then your next course that happens in a few people, but if you certainly, if you have unmedicated um, alcohol withdrawal, it can progress in about 15 to 20% of the time. You can get delirium tremens if you are if it is serious, okay? And that is, the hallmark of that is that you have vital signs that are abnormal, including um, uh, a change in your sensorium. Okay, so just looking at a little bit of the time course, um, so it just gives you a sense of when you have to worry about seizures, six hours to about 72 hours after your last drink, and then delirium tremens coming, uh, it can happen anywhere from 48 hours to two weeks after your last drink. And usually you can worry about DTs if you haven't medicated your alcohol withdrawal up until that point. Realize that also if you present with an alcohol withdrawal seizure that you have a, a much higher chance of them progressing to delirium tremens. So I think I may have, so I, I'm sure somebody here can tell me a little bit what, um, what is delirium tremens and maybe why it's called that. Anybody? Hmm? Hmm? DTs. We talk about it all the time. We always worry about DTs. We ask people about history of it. Okay, so DTs. It is a delirium, most importantly. Okay, so you have a change in your sensorium is it always have hallucinations? Not always, okay? Most importantly, you see a change in your vital signs. You either see like somebody who's hyperthermic, tachycardic, you have high blood pressure, so it's a hyperadrenergic state. And on top of that, you do not, like you, you have some change in your sensorium. So you, ha you are not able to like really understand what's happening around you, you look confused, okay? So important that that also has a mortality risk to it. Okay. Alcohol, alcoholic hallucinosis, okay, can develop um, within the last 12 to 48 hours of your last drink. Um, it's usually visual. People talk about like animals in their, in their periphery of their vision. So we, I, that's why I put a pink elephant up there. Um, and occasionally it can be other things. Just realize that if you are good at reality testing and you have an alcoholic hallucinosis, that it is not necessarily delirium tremens. That's the main reason that I put this up there and to make that differentiation. Because sometimes this comes up. Somebody says, I get a call, I just got a call from the emergency room maybe like a week ago. They said, this guy has hallucinations, um, he's seeing things out of the corner of his eye, but everything else looks good. Vital signs look good, he's able to talk and he knows where he is. Um, do I need to put him in the ICU? And so I said, no, I don't think you do. You're okay. Like, you know, I think this is what we're looking at is alcohol hallucinosis. Okay. Seizures. Um, this used to be really trendy. Now I don't think people know who she is. Oh, good. Thank goodness. Okay. I, I used to like her. Um, so when we talk about alcohol withdrawal seizures, um, we, I think about her a little bit. There was a thought that she might have died from uh, an alcohol withdrawal seizure. Um, 
can happen between uh, after you know six to forty hours after your last drink. Um, if you do not treat somebody who is a severe heavy drinker, um, maybe with a history of seizures, three to fifteen percent of people can go on to have them. These are tonic clonic. Um, that means that um, it is both sides of your body. Um, it the your risk factors include how much um, alcohol and how long it's been going on for. Most of these things are single episodes um, and realize that if you present in the emergency room right after you had an alcohol withdrawal seizure, you do need to watch out for DTs in those patients. Some of the risk factors for the DTs are if you have another medical illness, um, you have, uh, if it's been a long time since your last drink, so you, um, you come in and your, your alcohol withdrawal has already um, sort of recruited a lot of neurons and it's in a kind of a farther out stage. Um, you have a history of having DTs or having a seizure, you have a heavier, longer drinking history, and you came in with a high blood alcohol. And you already have, like sometimes people who um, still have alcohol in their system will start going into withdrawal, and so then you know that they have a very high tolerance. So some of the ways that we can look at alcohol withdrawal include this scale. Um, how many people have heard of the CIWA? Great, a lot of people. How many people have been um, in a hospital that uses CIWA to help medicate patients who have alcohol withdrawal. Great. How many love the CIWA? How many, th okay, love it. Good, good, good. How many people think that there are some problems with it? Okay, okay. What do you think are some of the problems? So as a medical, you know, internal medicine doctor, there's yes. half of this is, well, part of it's subjective, which can be caused by, say, obese. Mm -hmm. um, and then part of it could also be other, like sepsis or other medical issues that have nothing to do with alcohol. So it can be sometimes really hard to interpret. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also very, as mentioned, part of it's subjective. So you get, you know, change of shift with nursing and the CY goes from like 15 to 8. And yeah. There's no medications given in between. It's just a difference in how people do it. Um, so thank you very much. You're absolutely right that it is quite subjective. Um, it is quite broadly used. Um, it came out of Mayo Clinic. Um, initially, it, w what it wanted to look at is the, the, the factors that predicted seizure the most. And so that's really what you're looking at is if it's high, then you have a higher um, risk of going on progressing to a seizure. And so then those folks are the ones that need to be medicated. It really is only valid when you know that alcohol withdrawal is the main driving issue. It does not, in and of itself, diagnose alcohol withdrawal. In fact, it was getting so bad that the original makers of the CIWA protocol came out and had to write a paper, and they said, we're really concerned about the way that our, our scale is being used. So I think very important that we only apply it when we know that somebody has had a history of heavy alcohol use and has stopped. Okay, treatment and management. So well, some of our hallmarks of treatment strategy for alcohol withdrawal um, are that we want to make patients comfortable, we want to prevent their seizures, prevent DTs, and prevent medical complications, okay? Um, this is a, a sort of a picture to, to denote what a little bit about kindling theory, okay? So each time you go through alcohol intoxication, you go through withdrawal, then each time your threshold for um, how bad your withdrawal can be kind of decreases. So each time that you withdraw from alcohol, your withdrawal can get a little worse. And if you continue along that spectrum unmedicated each time, then you may progress to have a seizure issue. It's one of the reasons that I can see um, some of my patients who are binge alcohol users have seizures when they're in their early 30s because they, of this kindling theory. It's one of the reasons why when we see patients who have some symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, we want to make sure that we medicate them to protect their brains. If a patient comes to the emergency room and they're in alcohol withdrawal, um, these are some of the basics, okay? Consider other drugs in addition to alcohol. Um, we give thiamine. Uh, if your INR is elevated, we can give you vitamin K. And we replace your lights, magnesium and pot um, potassium and we just want to make sure that you know where you are and we give them reality orientation. Why do we give thiamine? Wernicke's. Wernicke's, what is it? Uh, so it's a disorientation syndrome where people's brains get really, I think it's like in mammalian bodies or something, and, and basically it can cause uh, nystagmus, gait instability, and uh, cognitive delay. 
Yeah, encephalopathy. Excellent. Thank you very much. So you're absolutely right. Um, we give thiamine to help prevent it. <coughs> One of the classic ways that you can precipitate like a wernicke korsakovs syndrome is if you gave, like somebody comes to the emergency room, they're a heavy drinker, they're very vitamin depleted, you, the nurse hangs a bag of D50 or, you know, the normal saline, and they don't put thiamine in it. So that means that all of a sudden their metabolic processes start working and it's running without thiamine, and they're thiamine deficient, and that can precipitate one of these encephalopathies. Okay, so you always give thiamine first. The regular dose of thiamine is 100 milligrams. There's some literature out there that you might not absorb all of that and that you actually might be quite thiamine deficient. So some other protocols, and certainly we're working on one where you actually use a much higher dose, 500 milligrams twice a day for three days to replete your stores. That's how it is at the general and so Oh, great. So I think we, there's sort of, unfortunately, in a regular banana bag, it's still 100 milligrams. So we kind of have to talk to people about using more. Okay, is there any benefit to giving people potassium or magnesium extra, you know, even if their potassium or magnesium were normal? to help protect it. Magnesium is always thought of as like a neurostabilizing uh, electrolyte. Yay, nay, good literature on it. No good literature on it, don't use extra magnesium, but definitely replace magnesium and potassium as needed. Okay, there's Carl Wernicke, um, and here's like a little netter of what it looks like to have Wernicke syndrome. There's the ophthalmoplegia. Um, and then there's ataxia, and then there's an encephalopathy, okay? And so thus we want to give um, thiamine first. Our drugs of choice for mild alcohol withdrawal, okay? Um, we can give it, um, it's pretty much benzodiazepines, okay? And we can give it in a number of different ways. Um, one way is, is that you just give it on a fixed dose. Somebody comes in, they're in alcohol withdrawal, you give them a benzodiazepine, and you give them three times a day for three days, and then you stop. Okay, that would be fixed dose. Um, a loading dose, it's where you give them a high dose in the beginning, 90 milligrams of Valium, and then you may not need to give them any after that, okay? Sometimes people use phenobarbital like that. They'll give a, a high dose of phenobarbital, it is a long-acting barbiturate, and then you can quiet down the brain and then it's so long acting it can almost self taper, okay? And then there's symptom driven protocols. And that's when you use the CWA and then you see how bad the alcohol withdrawal is and then you medicate after that. Symptom triggered protocols tend to be how most of us who work in hospital environments, that tends to be how most of us, you know, treat alcohol withdrawal per protocol. Is that true of most people? That's certainly true in my hospital. True in other people's? Yes? Anybody have a different experience? Did anybody do another fixed loading, loading dose, fixed sort of schedule? No. Um, other ways that you can um, treat alcohol withdrawal include, um, you can use things like beta blockers and clonidine. I don't really recommend a lot of beta blockers. I am gonna talk about clonidine. Realize that I think that clonidine can be really important and I'm gonna talk about a protocol, and I'm hoping that Dr. Paypack can also <coughs> chime in a little bit, since you're from Stanford, about this, fantastic. And then um, we talked a little bit about gabapentin for um, treatment of alcohol use disorder, but I'm gonna talk a, a bit about it for treatment of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Okay, so benzodiazepines are still one of the best ways to treat it. It is, um, it is considered the standard of care. If you look at almost every um, sort of book on this and you do a Cochrane review, it will talk about benzodiazepines. There are some seminal studies that show that it reduces seizures. When you treat alcohol withdrawal with benzodiazepines, it really doesn't matter which one. And it also reduces the incidence of delirium tremens. Um, I work at an institution, Kaiser Permanente, and we happen to love this drug called transine, um, which is called clorazepate. Anybody heard of it, used it, Okay, that's kind of why we use it a lot. Because um, you haven't heard it, and we really use it for detox. Um, it is the first metabolite of Valium, okay? So what you can see is that in the pathway of how chlordiazepoxide, which is also known as 
Librium. Librium, which is it, and what was the first benzo? What was the first benzodiazepine ever invented, created? Librium. Librium. Excellent. It's the first one. It has a bunch of metabolites, right? So one of the metabolites is the desmethyl des, uh, diazepam, which is kind of where we got diazepam from. Clorazepate is one of the um, is one. It's like an inactive form, and then it in your stomach it creates the first metabolite of Valium. And it has, it's a little less addictive, it pretty much works like Valium, and it comes in very tiny doses, so you can use it really easily for detox. So that's one of the reasons why I like it. It is hard to get at certain pharmacies, but we at Kaiser really love this drug and prescribe it a lot for detox. Another drug that I use quite a bit in mild to even a little bit of moderate alcohol withdrawal is gabapentin. Um, it has good anti-seizure properties. It's not like the best anti-seizure medicines, but it's good. Um, and it's been shown in a few small studies to be very effective. The study that I like was done out of South Carolina, Hugh Myrick. He compared head-to-head -head Ativan versus gabapentin and showed that pretty much you need to get like about 900 to 1200 milligrams of gabapentin per 24 hours in the first three days, and it helps to reduce um, your risk of seizure or DTs. Um, in addition, what he found is, is that um, after you stopped using gabapentin, that your risk of relapse was not as high as if you used Ativan. Okay, so he actually showed that, I mean, they were really equally efficacious in terms of reducing risk of seizure, but where gabapentin was somewhat superior is, is that when you stop the gabapentin, the risk of relapse was actually a little lower. Okay. And that's what he kind of showed here. Um, the gabapentin is the black line, and the probability of drinking is on the x-axis. And what you see is, is that the lorazepam has a little bit of a spike on day six, and that's after you stop using Ativan. So that's one of the issues is, is that when you stop using benzodiazepines, you get into a little benzo withdrawal, and then it increases your risk of alcohol use. Um, Clonidine. Clonidine is an interesting drug. Um, it is very old, it's been, it's very potent. It is used to treat blood pressure. Um, and it is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, okay? It helps to reduce sympathetic tone. Um, there's been, it's been studied for alcohol withdrawal before. It's, it, the results were so-so. Then this drug called dexmatomidine came on the scene. And do you, does anybody know what the other name for dexmatomidine is? Presidex, cool. Has anybody used Presidex for alcohol withdrawal? Yes. Elon, talk about it. Well, we've had, we've had pretty good. It's been okay. There's been yeah. a lot of concerns um, because of the uh, potential bradycardia, but we've had, we've had some success with it. Yeah. I think the ICU doctors really like it. You know, it's like people can, you can titrate it very well. Yes, you have to worry about, you know, bradycardia. Um, but what you find is, is that when, when somebody's alcohol withdrawal course kind of is about to go over and, you know, you're four days out, you can decrease the Presidex strip and people don't have a lot of delirium afterwards. When you snow people with benzodiazepines, you have to worry that then they, first of all, they don't wake up for a few days and then when they do, they're kind of delirious. So dexmatomidine became a place where people said, you know, I think that there really is something here where then people actually do better and then they're in the hospital for a shorter amount of time, which then renewed the interest in clonidine, which has a very similar mechanism of action. So clonidine has had some good renewed interest. So now I come to Stanford's protocol, which um, we are using quite a bit at our Kaiser Medical Centers with good success. And so, um, Jose Maldonado, who has been doing consult liaison work um, at Stanford for, gosh, maybe like 30 years, um, he sort of pioneered a protocol around this, which is basically to load you up with clonidine and to put a clonidine patch on you, and if you are at high risk for a seizure, use gabapentin, and has reported very good results. We've done some work over at Kaiser, like essentially trying to replicate his study, which we also find that it reduces um, hospital stay, like the length of your hospital stay, and our outcomes are very good. We have also reduced transfers to the ICU. Um, I do think that it's important to remember that like, <coughs> if 
if you have a history of a seizure, you do want an anti-seizure medicine on board like gabapentin or benzodiazepine, but um, clonidine can do very well in reducing adrenergic tone. Now, it's standard at our hospital to put, to use this, to do a clonidine load and to put two clonidine patches on people and then give them some gabapentin as well. We have a CWA protocol with benzodiazepines as a backup if needed. Um, so if you have a moderate to severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome, um, use benzos. Um, you could use phenobarbital, um, Presidex, or propofol. Don't use Dilantin. Um, try and stay away from Haldol. Um, it's not a great drug for alcohol withdrawal. And don't use um, like extra magnesium. If people's alcohol withdrawal is not under control, it really doesn't do anything extra. Um, for them. So we talked about Presidex or dexmetomidine, um, similar mechanism of action to clonidine, and uh, using the ICU decreases overall I a length of ICU stay. Phenobarbital, good study that was done out of Highland Hospital. They used um, a different uh, uh, scoring system for measuring alcohol withdrawal. And they, they sort of said, okay, these people will need 10 milligrams per kilogram of phenobarbital, and these folks, well, they, they don't meet enough criteria. What they found is, is that for those people that they did treat with phenobarbital, they decreased the number of people who then had a, an ultimate transfer to the ICU. So this is, it's really exciting. I think that phenobarbital can be very nice when somebody comes in and they're in moderately severe alcohol withdrawal, and you're really worried about them, you give them 10 milligrams per kilogram, you can then, then you definitely must admit them to the hospital, uh, and then you watch them. But I have seen people who have had like really severe alcohol withdrawal syndromes who then get phenobarbital, who then have a very, like a much shorter course in the hospital. Um, this was the, um, it's called the AWCA, the Alcohol Withdrawal Clinical Assessment Scale, and this was one of the scales that they used to decide who gets the who gets phenobarbital and who doesn't. Okay, propofol, um, I just put this up here so you remember who, who was abusing propofol. Um, it also, um, it potentiates the GABA-A receptor. If you're having a really hard time with someone who is in the ICU, they're on Presidex, they're on Ativan drips, and they are still really agitated, consider propofol. It could be um, your third agent to help treat severe alcohol withdrawal. Okay, um, almost done with this section, and then that gives us 15 minutes to talk about opiate withdrawal. Um, my take home points for mild alcohol withdrawal, you can use benzos or gabapentin. Um, use phenobarbital as an adjunct in patients with moderate to severe alcohol withdrawal. Um, Dexmetomidine and propofol can be useful. Um, and CDRP is the name of, well, it was the previous name of my clinic, uh, the Chemical Dependency Recovery Program. We are now Addiction Medicine and Recovery Services. Okay, treating opiate withdrawal. So, as some of you know, we might be in an opiate epidemic, right? We talk about it all the time, and so opiate withdrawal is definitely something that we will see a lot um, working in addiction, okay? Um, we also know that, you know, prior to 2015, we were dealing with prescription drugs and some heroin, and we were making some headway. And then fentanyl came on the scene. And a lot of the headway that we had made in terms of reducing overdose deaths has now kind of gone away, sadly. Um, we now see a lot more fentanyl on the streets. We see fentanyl that is laced in the stimulants, and that is resulting in a lot more overdose deaths. Oops. We also see some of the recommendations that are coming down from the CDC. We are trying to decrease the amount of opiates that we prescribe, even for people who have an injury or who go through surgery, because we know that if you are on opiates longer than three days, five days, seven days, you increase your likelihood of having um, a problem with an opiate use disorder later on. Okay, so now we try and give very short courses of opiates to people. And then we have the CDC guidelines, okay? These things came out in 2016, and they really have had quite a big effect on the healthcare system. Uh, essentially, 
they came out with 12 recommendations. They may have not had a lot of evidence behind every one of them, but they certainly came out and it became the standard of care very quickly. Um, and certainly I felt like physicians who were prescribing were essentially judged by this standard almost immediately. Um, and the idea was is that there was no evidence for long-term benefit of opiates for pain um, uh, versus no opiates for chronic pain, which essentially kind of put patients who were already on opiates for a long time, it kind of put them in this very weird position um, after this came out. So I'm sort of just telling you a little bit about why we might be treating opiate withdrawal in a variety of different circumstances, okay? So they came out with some key, recommend, some key recommendations and they really talked about how much like, you know, morphine milli equivalents you should consider going up to and they talked about, you know, don't use long acting pain meds in a short acting way, very important. The risk of overdose was higher in long acting pain meds, okay? And another huge thing which at the time I think was really important, not, it wasn't on the radar, it was just that the combination of sedatives and opiates puts you at a much higher risk for overdose. I feel like now, 2019, we have a much better awareness of it, and now thankfully we also have a much better awareness of the sleeper drugs like Ambien and Lunesta, that those also significantly contribute to overdose deaths when in combination with opiates, okay? So a little bit about the opiate receptor. It's a G protein um, receptor. Um, it has endogenous ligands, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't a receptor that was just designed for these, you know, oxycodone. Um, it has endogenous ligands, uh, and the most important one that we always talk about are endorphins, but there are other ones as well. And they're widely distributed. Most importantly, we talk about, certainly in opiate withdrawal, about um, all the GI symptoms, and of course mm -hmm. you see lots of opiate withdrawal with GI effects. Um, the main opiate receptor is the mu, and you can either completely activate it or partially activate it, like we have with buprenorphine. Okay. Um, so there's mu1 and mu2, they do slightly different things. And then we have the kappa um, receptor, which um, when you activate it with dynorphin, it can actually cause a little bit of dysphoria. And what drug might block the kappa receptor that we prescribe a lot of? Maybe one other one that definitely does it, I'm thinking other than naltrexone. Buprenorphine. Buprenorphine um, blocks the kappa receptor. It's one of the reasons why we think it has antidepressant properties. Um, places where you find it, again, the GI tract, spinal cord, um, and in different parts of the brain. And ways that you can treat opiate withdrawal. Um, so these are some of the main drugs that we are going to talk about. The opiate withdrawal timeline, you know, so realize that opiate withdrawal Okay, you get symptoms that can last for a while. And it really depends on what kind of drug you're using. Are you using a long-acting drug? Are you using a short-acting drug? Are you coming off of heroin or fentanyl, which is quite short-acting, and then you're gonna have a very intense short course? Or are you coming off of, coming off of a long-acting drug like methadone, where you're going to have perhaps a little bit less intense, but a much longer course? So realize that in the beginning, some of the symptoms that you will look at are gonna be like chills, fevers, body aches, sweats. Um, and then after you get through the acute symptoms, then you go into a little bit of the post-acute withdrawal where you have depression and anxiety, and again, some more insomnia. And then you have like some depression and some cravings and eventually this gets a little better, okay? But it does take a while. Um, I've had patients who really struggle with opiate withdrawal for months after coming off entirely. We use a scale to help measure opiate withdrawal. It's called COWS. This has been around for a very long time. This is a scale that really comes out of the Bay Area. Don Wesson and Walter Ling are the original authors on this paper, 2003 Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. Um, and it's been in use for a long time. There are some other drug scales, but this one's actually the most popular. Okay, it's a, good, it's a good way to measure opiate withdrawal. It's the way that we also use this scale in order to measure um, opiate withdrawal for like inducing Suboxone. So I think, Mike, 
they're already going to get a little bit of teaching about treatment of opiate use disorder, not opiate withdrawal, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm specifically not talking about buprenorphine for opiate withdrawal because I think it will be covered in another place. So I'm, I'm actually going to sort of veer into another direction where we're going to just talk about other ways that you can symptomatically treat opiate withdrawal. The idea being that that this may or may not be, when you're treating opiate withdrawal, it may or may not be opiate use disorder, okay? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes actually you have folks who have been parked on pain meds for a long time and actually they think that they wanna get off, you feel like they, they should decrease their dose and then you might deal with symptoms related to that. So that's a little bit of where I kind of took this is just treatment of opiate withdrawal symptoms. Um, one of your backbones of treating opiate withdrawal is going to be clonidine, okay? It's been around for a long time. Um, again, it is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Um, it helps to reduce sympathetic tone. Um, and although clonidine is one of the main ones and the side effect for it is gonna be lowering your blood pressure, another drug that is alpha, also an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist is um, guanfacine or 10X. And so sometimes that has less of an issue with blood pressure. So sometimes if I can't use clonidine, I'll use 10X. It doesn't work as well though. I think my patients tend to do better on clonidine. Um, and I use it for anywhere from one to three weeks. Lofexidine, it's sort of like a, it's like another drug that is kind of like clonidine, but a lot more expensive. I don't know if you get a lot more out of it. So, but I just put it up there to say it's there it acts the same way as clonidine. I think that it's a lot more expensive and I don't know if you're gonna get much more benefit out of it. So um, again, just things about clonidine. I think it is the mainstay of your, of your treatment for opiate withdrawal. Another way that you can treat it is to use a little bit of opiates. So realize that um, uh, tramadol it used to be a little bit in this nebulous land of like, is it an opiate, is it not? It sits on the opiate receptor, but its structure is not exactly like an opiate. Um, it's probably gonna get scheduled. For all practical purposes, it does act pretty much like an opiate. It can also, as an adjunct to your patient with opiate withdrawal, it can be very useful. So um, realize that you don't want to use a lot of it. Um, it has, uh, it, it sort of has like a little bit of effects of like, an SSRI um, or an SNRI, and so you run the risk of like if you use too much tramadol of a seizure. So just use it like a little bit. I usually use a backbone of clonidine and then I add a little bit of tramadol on if I need it. Um, AB 635, important. This was a law passed in the state of California that allowed us to um, essentially prescribe naloxone to patients who are at risk for an overdose and it doesn't even need a prescription. It can also just be a recommendation by a pharmacist. Um, this is what nasal naloxone looks like. That's what we use at Kaiser, and you can get that at the pharmacy. We prescribe it to almost every person who comes into our clinic. So we want to help to reduce overdose deaths. Very important. And then, of course, this year we have a law that was passed, and it really, said that we need to prescribe naloxone to every person who has a use disorder, anybody who is naive to opiates and we are prescribing a certain amount, or we're giving them a combination of opiates and benzos, or we're giving them uh, like more than a certain threshold amount of morphine milliequivalents. We need to prescribe um, some version of naloxone. We use nasal naloxone. Okay, well we got through both. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. We might have we have like two minutes for questions. Any questions? Yes. So um, you talked about treating alcohol or sorry opioid withdrawal in patients who don't have opioid use disorder. Yes. And one thing I've seen people do is prescribe buprenorphine sort of off label for that, um, induce them on bup, and then you know down titrate the bup. Or yeah. just keep it on because that can be useful for chronic pain. So I was just wondering, like, when would you go the clonidine tramadol route versus buprenorphine? I think that that's a lot. Like, one thing for sure, I don't think you can protocol it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that it's really important in those situations to 
talk to someone about their options because I think there are many times that we can get a referral from like a physician and they'll say, I think this person needs buprenorphine. And I think the trigger for us is to say, I need to go talk to that patient and really kind of get a sense of what's happening. Um, I have found that buprenorphine is okay at treating pain, but it's not great. If someone really is quite motivated to separate out from their full agonist opiate um, and yet finds that every time that they were on the, the full agonist opiate, they just couldn't control it, I feel like those folks are somebody that I like to put on buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. If it's a case where um, someone's a little younger, they got, they might be a little more mixed up with it, but it might be a little bit more of an addictive fashion, mm -hmm. then we might think about buprenorphine for a use disorder. If they are not interested in it at all, they're like, I don't want to be on that stuff. I, you know, I want, you know, they might even consider naltrexone okay. even. Then I might consider a taper with, with these medicines and then consider then a transition to naltrexone. Cool. Any other questions? We might have like a minute. But do they have another lecture after this? Oh, okay. We have time if people have questions. We have time. Um, if you want to take a break, you can also do that, and then um, I can hang out and you can ask me whatever questions you like. Okay. Cool. Thank you for listening.